All right. Hello. Good morning. How are you all doing this Sabbath? Good. All right. Very good. Let me turn this thing on here. All right. I think I should be able to control it now. Welcome to the Gainesville Adventist Church. Uh, my name is Ben Curette, and uh, if you've never been here, uh, I just want to have a special welcome for you, let you know that um, I'm just really glad that you guys are here. And uh, before we begin with our, you know, divine service, we want to go over some upcoming events, things that, you know, you should start planning for if you'd like to join us. Uh, and the first one, uh, and this kind of is like, like the one that a lot of these other ones will like feed off of, next Sabbath is something that we affectionately call All Day Sabbath. Uh, and the idea is that we come and, and we spend more time here than we usually do, right? And so what that looks like, uh, this every third Sabbath, we call it All Day Sabbath, and we uh, right after service, we'll follow it up with a potluck. This one is special uh, because this upcoming potluck uh, will be our Father's Day potluck, right? So good time to celebrate our dads and all that they do for us. Um, there's going to be some other things happening, like the AV meeting, and I'll get to that. Something that we also do on All Day Sabbath, we try to uh, maximize our outreach. And so our homeless ministry, the first and third Sabbath, so they don't just go one time, uh, but the third Sabbath uh, is homeless outreach. So they meet uh, usually like during slash after potluck, and they get everything together. And then they jump into their cars and they go out. And they are always looking for more people to join them uh, and to just be blessed. Uh, this, this ministry has done some really great stuff. We'll brag on them for a little bit. There was a family that they uh, came across, very young family. They just had a baby and they were homeless. But uh, through just connections that God had put together, they were able to get that family housing, get them a job. And so this is a, this is a good ministry to be a part of. Um, and so there's also that Sabbath at 5 p.m. You'll come back, and there'll be some things going on. We usually do Pathfinders and Adventures things as well, uh, but then there's a volunteer meeting for VBS at 5 p.m. next Sabbath. So a lot of stuff going on next Sabbath, but hey, we feed you, and that's always, <laughs> that always is a good thing. So I want to point special attention to this, the audiovisual meeting. So this is, this is just a constant need. You know, if you're ever wondering, like, man, what can I do to help this church? We always could use help uh, with audiovisual. Uh, that's just, you know, it's where we are in, in the day and age. Like, you couldn't hear me if I didn't have all of this. And, you know, if we, you know it's something that we like to have. So Sabbath, next Sabbath, during potluck, uh, while you're eating, please join our audiovisual leader, uh, Mr. Byron. Uh, and he will, uh, listen, if you want to get involved, you have it, he will teach you. And if you already are involved and you're like, hey, I've been on the schedule, uh, you got a meeting. So I <laughs> wanted to let you guys know about that. Uh, and then let me make sure I didn't forget anything. There is, um, like I said, the VBS volunteer meeting. VBS is going to be July 25th through the 29th. And so registration is open for kids, but also we need help with volunteers. And um, so don't forget about that meeting next Sabbath. And then on July 1st, uh, the Florida Conference is doing a one-day uh, women's retreat over, right over here at Camp Calacqua. So if you would like to go, uh, men, not you, but uh, women, if you would like to go uh, and you need some information, if you know who Florinda is, please find her. And if you don't know who Florinda is, find me, right? And my email and my cell phone number is in the bulletin, and I can get you connected to her if you want to go. So uh, with all of that, I just want to welcome you again to the Gainesville SDA Church and just let you know that I'm so glad that you're here. Good morning, church. Everybody ready to raise your voice? That saved a wretch like me. 
Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. He is by grace, you have been saved. Ephesians 2 14 and 15.
May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Second Thess Thess Thessalonians 2, 16 to 17. Without him. Father, without you, how lost we will be. Father, we thank you for this wonderful Sabbath day. You have given us six days to work and get everything done, but Lord, this is the day that you have set apart, you have sanctified it, you have blessed it, and Lord, you have invited us into your throne room, into your presence. So we can praise you. Thank you for sending your angels to sing with us this morning. Lord, we give you the praise for what we will receive from your hand. Thank you for the message that you are sending for us. And Father God, we pray that your people will be blessed. When the message come, Lord God, help that your people will hear your word and be edified. We give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You want to stand for the intro? <laughs>
time for the children's story. Kids, we want you to go to the back and pick up the baskets and be sure you go on all four aisles to make sure you get all the money. While they're doing that, we're going to sing a new version of Jesus Loves the Little Children. Please pay attention to the words. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Every culture, every race, all are covered by his grace. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Every culture, every by his grace. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Every culture, every race, all are covered by his grace. Jesus loves the little children of the world. look so pretty together. We might as well squish in here. We have a smaller group, so we can talk over here. We're going to do a little bit of talking today. Okay, so tell me, everyone, what does gratitude mean? This is a big word. Gratitude. Tell me. Angry? No, it's kind of the opposite of angry. Gratitude, to be grateful. Have you ever heard your parents or your teachers talk about that? Being grateful? It actually means being thankful. That's another word. Did you, how many of you know the word thankful, right? Yeah, we could be thankful for lots of different things, right? What are some things you're thankful for? We're thankful for our parents. Yes, we're thankful for the parents. What else? The yeah. air. Yes, we need air to breathe. What else are we thankful for? Anybody else? What are we thankful for? Our siblings. Yes. Who else are we going to fight with? The trees. Trees. Yes, we need lots of trees for all the shade. Our family. Our families. Anybody else? You guys thankful for anything? Our parents. Parents. Food. Food. Yes, we need food. Elderlies. Yes, we need to learn a lot for people who are older than us. Water. And water. We can't live without water. But guess what? I believe that God wants us to be thankful even when things aren't going very well. Did you know that? You know, we have to be thankful in all occasions. So let's think of a few different situations that things are not going very well, but we have to find something that we could be thankful for, okay? So what if you were invited to the beach? How many people like the beach? Yeah, we're Floridians. We love the beach, right? Okay, and guess what? It starts thundering and storming, and we can't go to the beach. Man, now we're home, and it's raining and raining and raining, but we're asked God asks us to be thankful. So what can we be thankful when that happens? Well, we could um, we could maybe, like, if we had a pool by our house, we could, like, if it was an indoor pool or something, we can go in the pool if our, our friends had one or something. That is very true. So we could be thankful for friends who have pools so that we can still have fun. What else can we be thankful for? We, we can be thankful that the water... Um, um, helps the trees grow. Yes, we could be very thankful that the water is yeah, watering the trees. Yeah. We can just go inside and have like a like a family reunion. Yes, we could have family game night or something instead. That sounds like fun. Or just go to the bathtub. 
<laughs> we could be thankful that we have a bathtub to just sit in the water. That's a good one. Some of us may not fit in that one. <laughs> All right, let's think about another one. What if your friends invited you to, your, to their house to have a, a, a play date, right? But then you get sick, and now you're in bed not feeling well. How in the world are you supposed to be thankful about that? Can you think of something we could be thankful for for that? If you're sick in bed and you can't be with your friends? We can pray for God so maybe we can come out for another day. So we could be thankful that we have a God that can help us heal? That's a good one. We can, um, we can just see, like, we can, if, if you want to have some fun, you can, like, count the days to see how long it takes you to get better. <laughs> so we could be thankful for that. <laughs> or sleep. We thankful we have time to sleep. Yes. Medicine. We're thankful that we have medicine to make us feel better. Very good. Well, I'll tell you one thing that I was thankful for, for something that didn't do well this week. This week, my car battery died while I was at work. Are you kidding me? <laughs> yes, it's true. And I had a big appointment that I had to go to, but my car wouldn't start. So I was very sad and very frustrated, but I knew God wanted me to be thankful. So you know what I was thankful for? I was thankful for all the coworkers and the people I work with because they came out and jumped my car so that my battery can work, so I can take it and get a new battery and I was able to get to the appointment. And so I'm very thankful for the people I work with because they helped me out in a pinch when I needed them, right? Okay, one more comment. I hope they're professionals. <laughs> they're professionals, they know how to jump a car. <laughs> So, so now we're learning that even in the bad situations, we can be thankful, right? And Jesus tells us that um, in Psalms 118.1, the psalmist there is made a song that says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good and his mercy endures forever. So among everything that we go through, whether it's good things or bad things, we have to be gr grateful, right? Because God makes sure that everything we do will be good for us at the end, whether we're sick, whether we're healthy. It's God who blesses us, and we have to be very thankful for that, right? My grandma, she made a disc, and it had all, um, she made songs out of almost all the, the verses. So it's a fun way to learn all the verses, and also I'm still learning God. That's a great way. We're thankful for grandmas who do that, right? All right, so now come together. Let's pray and be thankful for all the things that we got. So come with me over here, and we're going to pray together. Okay. Oh, be careful. You okay? All right. Come, come, come. It's always good to have group prayers. All right. All right, let's all bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for being such a great God that even in the good things and in the bad things, you always make it out good for all of us who love you. I want to bless each and every one of these wonderful kids here for they know who you are in their lives and they know when to be thankful and grateful. And we also want to bless all the parents of all these kids and everyone in our church Lord, that we will continue to honor and praise you for everything you do for us. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. I'm grateful for you guys. And make sure that you go see Miss Becky and thank her for all the nice stickers that she gives us every week, okay? Sabbath everyone so now um, it's time for Garden of Prayer um, and thank you Sherilyn for a wonderful introduction the theme for today is gratitude um, and so 
So we'll have our Garden of Prayer song, and um, I invite everyone to sing. And if you would like to come up and pray with me, or if you're at your seat, then you could, um, you know, get in an attitude of prayer. Um, so just, you know, I want to say that oftentimes when we pray, we spend the whole time talking. We spend the whole time telling God what we want, what we need, the, the, the siren, the, you know, the wah, 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 the, the car sounds of the police car or the ambulance. Um, but prayer is a relationship. Um, and God wants us to um, spend time to listen to him too. So it's a conversation. So while we spend this time today pray, praying, um, so I hope that we will listen to his voice while he responds to her, our prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come before you, Lord, we just want to thank you, Lord. Father, we want to thank you for this moment and this space and this time. Thank you for this place. Thank you for every brother, sister, auntie, uncle, friend, family that is in this place, Lord, whether here um, in your sanctuary, Lord, or whether you're at home listening in. Wherever we are, Lord, we just come before you, Lord, and we, we first want to thank you, Lord. We want to thank you for the fact that you made us. You created us. You brought us in this place, Lord, at this time. And, Father, we don't live, we don't breathe, we don't do anything, Lord, if not for your word, if not for your power, if not for your might, Lord. We are not here. And so, Lord, we just want to spend this time, this moment, to praise you, to thank you, to glorify your name, to call on you, to say, Father, Abba, Jehovah, God. Lord, we just want to say thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Father, as we come before your presence, Lord, we know that you want to be in relationship with us, Lord. You want us to live an abundant life. You want us to, to understand all the principles, all, the, all the, the, the important things of why we are here and, and just the foundation and, and, and understanding that we're not here by chance. We're not here by accident. We're not here um, without a purpose. There is a purpose for us being here. And that purpose, Lord, is to love you and serve you, Lord. But it is a purpose that you call us to, that we have a choice. We're not forced to do it, Lord. You call us to do it in love. We could choose to love you. We could choose to not love you. And because we have a choice, Lord, um, we are grateful. We are thankful for this choice to love you. And, and Father, we thank you for loving us. Thank you for not giving up on us. So, Father... Before we do anything, we just want to come and we just want to ask, Lord, that you will forgive us of our sins, that you will cleanse us of all unrighteousness, 
And that when we come before you, Lord, that if we have things that we are holding on to, Lord, that will stop us from being in relationship with you, Lord, that you will give us the strength, the power, the energy, give us, give us the motivation, the courage, give us what we need so that we could overcome all these things that would stop us from drawing close to you. And Lord, because your words say that all we have to do is ask and you will give it to us, in confidence, Lord, we want to thank you for that forgiveness. We want to thank you for that peace that comes from knowing that we are forgiven and that we are free. And that this freedom to serve you, that we could come, come with a fresh start, with a fresh hope. Knowing that when another obstacle comes, that you are there and you can take us over, Lord. Father, thank you for providing us with all the blessings you have given us. Thank you for the food that you give us every day. Thank you, Lord, for your word that says live every day. Thank you, Lord, for the house that you put us in, whether we own it or we rent it. Thank you that we are not out in the element, in the heat and the cold. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for the jobs that you give us, Lord. Thank you for the occupation, the profession. And Father, I ask that we will in every situation, every choice, every moment reflect you. Thank you, Father, for the parents that we have. Thank you, Father, for the children that you have given us. Thank you, Father, for every day, every minute, giving us a chance to choose you. Father, at this time, you know, thank Sister Sherilyn for, for wonderful children's story that you have put on our heart. Lord, you see every single one of us, and you see right now, every one of us, Lord, have something that we, Lord, that, that we know, Lord, that is, is troubling our hearts. Whether we're sick or our parents or family or or somebody we know is sick, whether we are in a financial bind, whether we are in a, in a crisis in our family, whether we are in a crisis at work, whether we are in a crisis in, in, in the people that we interact with, whether we are in a crisis with you, Lord. Father, you know every single one of those situations, Lord. And Father, while we are in this crisis, while we are calling and asking and praying for your, for your healing and redemption and for your covering and for you to pull us through, Lord. We are praising you even in the crisis. We are, we are thanking you even in the crisis because, Father, we know that this relationship we are in with you, Lord, it is a real relationship. And, Lord, that you, Lord, have the power to heal those who are sick and so we are thanking you for even this time when we are sick Lord we're thanking you because we know that you will do the work that you promised you will heal when we're broken you will fill those lonely places in our hearts when we feel lonely you will come in and mend our broken marriage and and those points Lord that we feel like we have no control you Lord have the control. So we thank you. Father, as we're about to close this, this moment, this time, this wonderful time with you, I'm going to pause so that every single one of us will get a minute to call on you and talk to you.
As we close, Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you for this church and thank you for every person who has come and who is praising your name and who is serving. Thank you for the pastor, Lord, be with him. Send your Holy Spirit to do a work in him. Thank you for everyone who will minister and serve today, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And we ask all this, Lord, through your precious son, Jesus. Amen. So now it's time for um, tithe and offering. Um, so I, I, you know, I have this very short testimony. Um, God has been so good in all his blessings. Everything that he has provided. Um, you know, I've, um, I've seen over the years how um, in this very small thing that he has asked me for, 10% um, of, you know, whatever I earn, um, and, you know, every time that he has blessed me with something um, to give um, just because he has been so good. And, you know, really God is, is such a good God about everything that he does and he's so faithful. There was a crisis at home and, you know, I budget very tightly. Um, and, you know, you know, it turned out that I needed a specific amount of money to do something. And, you know, I was, you know, I was saying, Lord, you know, I don't want to constantly be in this place where I'm asking you to provide this financial need. And I decided, okay, I'm going to check my account, um, you know. And it doesn't always happen. I mean, <laughs> I'm, not gonna, I'm not saying that it's going to happen to you or, um, you know, it may have happened to you. But I'm just saying this is a testimony of what God has done for me. Um, I opened my account and I'm like, where did all that money come from? I'm not rich. Um, and so I discovered that um, there was a, what we call like a patent, a discovery that we made and you get like some money back from the discovery. The university takes like a bunch of it and they give you back a small portion. And literally to cover the crisis, the money was exactly there. How? Right? So this is a testimony of, you know, sometimes I, I worry and I'm like, Lord, you know, I'm going to pay this. And I worry about that other part, but um, God is so good that he will take care of the other part. So, um, you know, while we do our tithe and offering, um, you know, just to remember that we don't give it to God so that God can give us back. But he is faithful in doing that. Um, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before you and as a, we're about to give our tithe and offering, Father, we come trusting, holding onto the promise of all that you have given us. Father, we pray that you will bless it that you will use it according to your perfect will. And, and while we are here in this season, Lord, we just want to spend a minute to thank you for all that you have given us. Through your son, Jesus. Amen.
Good morning. Happy Sabbath. On your program, you will have seen that it's Josh, and it is Josh. But I'm here. Um, something happened today, and you know, the theme today is what? Gratitude. And so we're thanking God. And I'm thanking God. Come on. Oh. I'm thanking God for this privilege to share this moment with my student. <laughs> So um, it is a privilege, um, and it's so, it's so good to see how God works things out. Um, this is not the time to tell you the story behind it, but I can tell you that we're standing here because God made it happen. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> how can I say thanks? For the things you have done for me, have done for me, things so undeserved, yet you gave to prove your love for me, your love for me, the voices of a million angels could not express my gratitude. To all that I am, I am and, and ever, ever hope, hope to, to be, be. I, I owe it all to be to God be the glory.
Amen and amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. My name is Shante Duggins. I'm a member of the Symphony of Grace and Love Ministry. Uh, many of our members are wearing purple shirts today. And this Sabbath service is brought to you by the Symphony of Grace and Love Ministry, um, affectionately known as SGLM. And we are the disability ministry of our church. Our mission is to bring awareness about various disabilities in an effort to serve and include all with grace and love. We partner with um, individuals with varying disabilities, their family members and caregivers, uh, preparing individuals to disciple everyone, including those with disabilities. We also partner with a number of organizations that support and facilitate services on behalf of individuals with disabilities. And we often do a number of um, services both inside and outside of the church. Um, Oftentimes, we serve at our local nursing home. We also provide uh, food and support to members in our church as well. So what is a disability? A disability is a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more of a person's major life activities. It can be present at birth or come about in a moment of crisis, such as an accident or an injury, and it can emerge over time, such as visual impairment, which is one of the disabilities that we've shared in the past few months. It can include uh, short-term or long-term and can include physical or intellectual impairments, or both. And we know that each individual with a disability face unique challenges, but there's something that we all have in common. They are people first. They experience the same joy, love, sadness, and hope that we all do. And it is our job, it is our mission to serve all. A few facts about disabilities. Um, over 82 million Americans have a disability or chronic illness. And that equates to approximately one in five individuals that live with some type of a disability. Roughly 65 million Americans provide care for someone with a disability, often known as a caretaker. Uh, there are, according to the 2010 census, uh, there are 5.2 million children under the age of 15 that have some type of disability, and about half of those are classified as a severe disability. Uh, we, often, we also know that for individual, individuals with disabilities, they have the same spiritual needs as we do. And so they need to know the truths of the Bible. They need to know that they are loved by God. They need to know that they are unique as we all are. So with all of our abilities and all of our disabilities, we are all special to God. There's a verse that, um, as a part of the Symphony and Grace and Love Ministry, that we hold dear to our hearts, and it comes from Psalms 139, verse 14. And it reads, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Happy Sabbath all, and I hope you enjoy what we've presented today with the Symphony of Grace and Love Ministry. Happy Sabbath. Well, amen to that. Um, when they asked me to read the scripture reading this week, I was a little taken aback because we've had such beautiful young people reading our scriptures. I hope I can measure up. <laughs> this week's scripture reading is 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. And Paul instructs us, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Good morning, still. <laughs> I get that messed up all the time. Uh, and then I look silly when I look at my watch. But uh, good morning to all of you. 
And uh, if I wasn't here to greet you when you uh, when, when I was up here earlier, I just want to let you know I'm glad that you're here. And if you're a first-time visitor, I'm extra glad that you're here, and I you know, want to invite you to our church. Um, before I begin, um, I need to make an announcement. Uh, this is something I did. I want to say this happened about a year and a half ago, maybe a year and three months ago. Um, some scammers, <laughs> some scammers, they have this thing. They like to take my email address. If you look at the uh, bulletin, you'll see my email address is bjcuret at gmail.com. What they'll do, and I don't know what it is about me that they think this is a guy that we need to impersonate, but they'll do something that'll say like bjcuret1 at gmail.com, and then they start to email you guys, and they'll say things like, hey, this is an urgent message. Please get back to me. And you guys think it's me. <laughs> And uh, what they start to do is they'll say something to the effect of, um, uh, I need, uh, I'm at a hospital right now, and I'm visiting a member, and they need some Apple gift cards. Uh, and I just want to get ahead of that. We, we did this, like I said, like a year and a half ago, we dealt with this, and we just started reporting. If you get those emails, and the reason I'm saying it is because I got like three calls this week, like, Pastor, what's going on? Are you okay? <laughs> And uh, realized, oh, they're back. The scammers are back. And so I just want to let you know, if you get an email from me asking for money or gift cards, that's not me. Please report that account. Please report that email address. And I, th I made a joke a while back, and it still stands. If you get an email from me, and it's asking for anything other than, like, student loan money, like, <laughs> then if it's asking, hey, I, I need help with my student loans, and that's probably me and then you can help a brother out. But if it's anything else, that's not me. So I just want to let you know, let's start reporting those if you get them, because that worked last time. So anyway, sorry that that's happening, and you know, things happen. But uh, let's go ahead and pray. <laughs> let's go ahead and pray, and uh, we will open up the Word of God together this morning. God in heaven, we thank you so much for this Sabbath. God, we thank you for all the sacrifices you have made for us, the uh, love that uh, like just overflows. God, we thank you that we can be thankful in all circumstances because of your love for us. And so, God, now I ask that you would <clears throat> bless me with the Holy Spirit this morning as I open up the Word of God with my friends here. And I ask that you would help me to preach with boldness uh, and with truth in all that I do in your name. Amen. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Uh, I've talked before about um, the car that I was able to use uh, during high school that my grandmother just wasn't able to uh, drive anymore. But uh, unfortunately, uh, she passed away my freshman year of college. Um, and uh, so what the family did, they sold the car, you know, to help with all the funeral things. And um, I remember saying to my parents, I was like, listen, I'm in college. What if we just, you know, like what if we made some payments on it or whatever and I could just take it to, to school? because I'll need a car. And my parents were like, you really thought, <laughs> you really thought you're getting a car in college. We know how it is in college. You're away and, you know, it's a new city and new friends and you're never going to study. You're going to be in your car all the time, driving around all over Chattanooga and all of this. And I said to myself, how did they know? Man, <laughs> they got me. And so I went the entire freshman year without a car. Uh, and here's the irony. When I did get my own car sophomore year, I realized, I was like, you know, I go off campus so much less now that I have my own car than when I didn't have a car. <laughs> when I didn't have a car freshman year, I was just jumping in other people's cars. We were always going other places anyway. But I just remember when it was time after freshman year, we're going to sophomore year, and my parents are like, you, okay, it's time for us to get you your own car. Uh, you know, having some money that I saved up and some money that they saved up. And, and I, I just, 
I wanted a stick shift car. That's what I learned to drive, and so I just had it. I just had this desire. I don't care what kind of car it is as long as it's stick shift. And it, my first car, my first car ever was a red 2001 Honda Civic stick shift two-door. I love that thing. I miss it a lot. And um, anyway, we bought it, and the first thing I got to do with it, we made sure that it was okay, and then I got a job at, the, at a summer camp in North Carolina, and so the first thing I got to do after it was all tuned up and ready to go, we drove it all the way to South Carolina, and, and I worked there that summer, and I drove people back and forth on our days off to different places and explored South Carolina. It was great. The end of the summer comes, and it's time for me to go home, and I pack all my things back into the car, and I begin to venture out on the road, and I get, and the, the camp is in the middle of nowhere, Nasoka Pines Ranch, if you've ever been there, it's in the middle of nowhere, so it takes like 30 minutes just to get into civilization, and I finally make it into civilization, luckily it happened there, and all of a sudden, the car makes a funny noise, and the RPMs are just redlining, but I'm only going 25 miles an hour, what could be wrong? Uh, and I begin to get worried, and I'm like, well, this isn't great, and I pull over, and my, like, just my car was overheating. So I'm stuck in a state that I am unfamiliar with, for the most part. Uh, summer camp is over. <laughs> you know, I don't have any reason to really stay, and, you know, most of my friends have already left, who I worked with ca at camp with, so I'm, I'm like, oh, man, what do I do? What do I do? And uh, you find out, or we find out that what it was is my radiator, we didn't realize, had a crack. And so it had been leaking all summer, all summer, all summer, until I tried to leave, and then I couldn't. Uh, and so <laughs> we take it over, or I take it over to this place to get it looked at, and they say, that's going to be hundreds of dollars to fix for you. You have to get a brand new one. And I was like, oh, man, because like, if you ever worked at a summer camp, you know that you only make a couple hundred dollars <laughs> over the summer. And I was like, well, man, what am I going to do? And so uh, I had to park my car. I had to call the camp director. They had to come get me back in town, take me back to the camp. And I call my dad, and I say, Dad, I'm having a bad day. My car is broken, uh, and it's going to cost all this money to fix it, and I don't really know what to do. And, uh, you know, as Sherry Lynn was talking about, like, there are moments, I mean, she's talking about right now, her car is not, is not working, and I was like, man, I kind of resonate with what I'm going to talk about today. That was not a moment that I felt really great. I was like, this is my first car. It's already going downhill. This isn't great. I'm, I, I, was, I was so in my head about it, and I was so bummed out about it. And my dad, he said something that I never expected him to say when I called him, all the way back in Orlando, he goes, I'm on my way. And I was like, Dad, I know that you have to work and you have to do all this stuff. And, and what you, if you do know about my dad, he's a firefighter. And so the way his schedule works, he works 24 hours. So he's awake for 24 hours. Then he gets 48 hours off and he's 24 on, 48 off. I called him. He was coming home from a 24, he'd been awake 24 hours straight. He says, I'm on my way. I was like, Dad, please don't do that. I was like, that, I'm already, I'm already in the car. <laughs> and he drove and he drove and he drove. And so um, it wasn't a necessarily a time to be thankful that my car had broken. Uh, but as I look back on these moments, I look back with gratitude, um, gratitude and love. Uh, because I had a father who, when I was in trouble, uh, the words that came out of his mouth were, I'm on uh, my way. We're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 today. Um, this is a letter. Uh, Paul, he gets into the habit of writing a lot of letters to different churches uh, among the Gentiles. Paul is an amazing character of the Bible. I, you know, whenever we get to heaven and it's like, who do you want to meet? You know, some people might say David. Of course, we all want to meet Jesus. The first thing we do, but the second, the second stop is, who do you want to meet? Moses, you know, uh, uh, Abraham. Who do you want to meet? I want to meet Paul. Uh, Paul, I cannot wrap my mind around the tenacity of this guy. Just, he, he was so against God. If you know the story, he was so against Jesus, rather, in the beginning. And God, Jesus meets him on the road 
that he's, he's going to a town to kill followers of Christ. And Jesus meets him on the road and is like, why are you persecuting me? These are my people. You are hurting me. And this guy catches the gospel and he takes it and it just blows up all over the Gentile world. And so this letter is to a church in a place called Thessalonica. And so Paul, what you need to know is that when Paul went there the first time, he established this church with his, with his people who were with him. And they established this church. This place, Thessalonica, was steeped in um, what they saw as okay, but what we would consider as just abhorrent like sexual perversion in terms of worship. That's how they worship their gods. They would have these places, essentially brothels, that they would go. And it was just, that was the culture. That was the norm. And the gospel comes into this city and is so countercultural. And it was, it was meeting people with, the, with their needs. They were finding freedom. They were finding a new way of life. They were, you know, they were once dead in their sin and now alive in Christ, and the gospel in Thessalonica blew up. But it blew up in a way that because it was so different from the culture, it started to affect, this is crazy, it started to affect the revenue of the town right? Because the, uh, the people would come to this temple, they'd pay their little temple tax, they'd go into the brothel. Like, there was an economy to the evil and the sin of this town that was just normal. And the gospel comes in and says, this ends here. We do not need to be slaves to sin. We can live a new life in Christ. And so the economy is affected. Could you imagine a, a, a United States where the gospel is so prevalent that it disrupts the economy? crazy. But this was, the, this was the place. And so the society turns on the people. They are so faithful to God that they begin to be persecuted. Uh, Paul, he says it, that they are persecuted by their own countrymen. This is hard to like understand because I don't know how much we have experienced something like this, but these are your co-workers right? These could even be your, your cousins, your brothers, or your sisters who don't understand this new thing about you. These are people that maybe if you, you know, some of us, not me, but some of you were, you know, signed up in the military, and now you are a veteran, and you've come home, and these are people that you fought with, and now they are fighting against you. The, the, the disruption in your life is, is, is hard, and it's enough, really, to make most churches, a lot of the letters Paul writes, if you go through the books, it's rare for you to find one where Paul is like, I'm just so proud of you guys. Most of the time, Paul is like, what have you done? I was just, I leave for five minutes and you guys start going and, 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 and worshiping other gods and doing all this stuff. It's rare that you find a letter where Paul is just so excited. If you turn to the very first chapter uh, so, uh, 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 2, it says, We give thanks to God always for all of you constantly, mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you, not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord, and you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you, in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. This is a group of people. I, we talked last week about how your faith is contagious. Despite, this is what's crazy, despite the persecution, the faith begins to spread among the people because 
The gospel is, literally means, good news. The gospel is good news to all of us. It is. It says that you have messed up. That is true. And that the penalty of that mistake is, is death and eternal death. But Jesus Christ, who loves you, paid that price. And now you can live in newness of life. This is good news. So it, what, what it is, is whatever struggle you have, there is freedom from that. You are not your struggle, right? You are not the sin that you commit. We do this all the time. We say that, you know, I am an alcoholic, or I am an addict, or I am an angry person, or I am a, a, a hate-filled person, or I am a lustful person, and the gospel comes in, Jesus comes in and says, you are not those things. You are my child. The gospel is about identity, right? My car breaks, I am stranded, but because I have a father who loves me, his words were not figure that out. His words were, I'm on my way, right? And so that is why this beautiful, beautiful gospel is spreading among all the people. And so Paul, he, this letter is an interesting one. Like I said, most of the ones are very like, you guys need to be doing this because you're doing that wrong. The whole letter is like, keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> right? Keep doing what you're doing. It's going well for you. We are so proud of you. We love to hear what you guys are doing. And he says to, you know, just abstain from all sexual immorality and remain strong in your faith because people are watching. People are watching us, right? Uh, and so that is not something that we should take lightly, friends, that your coworkers watch you. Your cousins, they watch you. Your brothers and sisters, they watch you. Your parents, they watch you, right? Uh, the people that were driving, a ro you know, <laughs> the person who cuts you off and you just want to yell at them, they're watching you, right? Like, people are tuned in to what's going on. It's not a coincidence, right, that we see so much perceived, because um, it's not like this persecution, but we see stuff, right? We see stuff in the news. We hear stuff like that we would say, like, Christianity is, is under attack. And I'm using air quotes because there, what we would consider attack is not what the Bible <laughs> considers uh, attack. These people were dying, right? And there are people in the world who are still dying for their faith. We are not, we are not there yet. It could happen. Right? We believe that it might happen. Uh, and so we find ourselves in this story to say, beloved, if you are faithful, remain faithful because people are watching you. Okay? So uh, this verse that we are in today is at the very end. In fact, so Paul, he has said, you guys are doing great. Keep doing what you're doing. And so he's closing the letter here. Uh, at least this part of the letter, uh, and he is, <clears throat> he is uh, encouraging the people to, again, we're back where we started, to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. This is a hard verse to accept, and we've talked about this in a bunch of different ways here because I feel like it is important. I don't know if we talk about it enough in, in, in churches, right? That we just, we say these things, and they can be very hurtful, actually, right? Somebody, <laughs> on, on face value, right, Paul is writing letters to church members who probably have had people they loved who accepted the gospel killed because of what they believe. And Paul comes and he says, I want you to be thankful always. That's a hard thing to hear for someone who just lost someone they loved, right? For somebody who every day is uncertain. That is a hard thing. And, and how can I rejoice always, God? You're telling me that, you know, my, my wife just passed away. You tell me that my husband just got sick, that my kids are, are gone. I don't know where they are. You're telling me, God, that my bills that I'm getting a bunch of 
final notices on them, and I have no way of paying for them because I am spending all my money on medical bills. Like, God, how can I rejoice always? Are you telling me, God, that there are not moments where I should be frustrated and angry uh, and upset? Well, Jesus got upset. It's one of the most famous stories in the Bible. Jesus walks into the temple, and he sees that they have turned it into what he calls a den of thieves, and he begins to flip tables. We talk a lot about the peaceful Jesus, but sometimes we neglect that Jesus holds the line, (laughs) and he drew the line there. There are moments, and we have talked about the whole spectrum of human emotions here before. It is okay to not be happy all the time. We live in a broken world. So we have feelings and emotions and experiences that are touched by sin. And sin is bad, right? And so you, the, the, proper, the proper reaction to a broken and sinful world is to like want to be away from it, right? When pain happens, you want to get away from it. Like you, 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 when, if you get hurt enough, you might cry, right? You might cry out to somebody, right? That is what a broken world does to people. And Paul is acutely aware of this, right? Paul, this isn't the only church he's been at. Paul has seen some things. In fact, Paul has done some things to God's people. And he says, rejoice always. Now, what you're going to notice about these verses, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. This is like just a continuous, continuous, continuous thing. Um, And uh, I want to talk a little bit about this one because pray without ceasing used to really get me as a teenager, right? Because Uh, as we all do from time to time. Sometimes it can be difficult to understand which verse should I take literally and which verse should I take like the principle of. Because as a teenager, I read that and I said, okay. And as I was walking around doing things, uh, dear Jesus, you know, I'm, I'm going into my room now and, uh, you know, I'm turning the light on Jesus. And I, and then I had this thing, (laughs) I was like, but when I go to sleep, I won't, I won't be praying unless my dreams are prayers. So I tried really hard to like pray in my dreams, but you can't control this. So it was a stressful thing, and we can take this literally. And sometimes people will tell you literally as you are going throughout your day, you should be praying. And I don't think that's a bad thing, right? But it's not, it's literally not realistic right? Uh, This is a, uh, how we would say, just like a, uh, it's describing the character trait that we should have, right? So, for example, you know, my arms are only so big and they can only reach certain places. Sometimes my back itches, right? Everybody can relate to this. And I'll say, Raquel, please, please, right here, I need you to, it's been bothering me for so long, it's so scratch, and I'll say something like, don't ever stop doing that, that is amazing, right? I don't literally mean that. You understand what I'm saying? Because if she literally never stopped, that would begin to hurt, and it, it's not realistic, right? What about this? We would say that um, couples should be in what we would call constant communication, do you guys agree with that? Couples need to talk always. They need to, does that mean that at all moments of the day I need to be following Raquel around? Hey, how you doing? How you feeling? What's going on? How you doing? There needs to be a break. <laughs> we can't always do that. I mean, sometimes we got to go to sleep. What we can take from this is the principle. When we say, and you say, you know, to somebody, you know, somebody asks you, hey, have you been, um, have you talked to the boss recently? And you would say, yes, we are, we are constantly communicating. That means that there is a principle of when you reach out, they answer. And when they answer, you answer back, right? But it doesn't mean that you're sitting by your computer all the time waiting for that email to come in. 
but you know that that person, when you call on them, will answer you. And the same thing with our relationships and our friendships. We are in constant communication with our friends uh, and our family, or we should be. That doesn't mean that we are literally always bugging them and talking to them, but we know that when we need to contact them, they are available. And so Paul is reminding his people, listen, I know that you guys pray, but pray continuously. And so what I, what I take from this as I, as I read this is there are times when we stop praying. This is an encouragement or this is a reminder saying, listen, I know that things will happen and you will stop praying. So my friends, I'm asking you to pray constantly without ceasing. We fall into traps. We talked a little bit about prayer last week. This is working out again uh, as we talk about gratitude. Because you cannot, the Bible says, like, when you pray, don't be anxious for anything, but when you pray, come to God with thankfulness first, right? With a thankful heart. And so prayer and thankfulness and gratitude go hand in hand. And so um, there is a trap that we fall into, I think, where we all have prayer requests. We all have things on our minds, on our hearts, uh, burdens for us, maybe opportunities we're looking for, and we begin to pray for them. And we are so used to an Amazon Prime society where we say, if I reach out there, it's at my house in two days, that we pray and we pray and we pray. And maybe it's been a week, two weeks, a month. And we think to ourselves, well, I've been praying about it. I've prayed enough. Well, I give up because my prayer has not been answered. There are moments where we think we've done enough, we've prayed enough about a thing, and, 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 and that we just stop. Now, somebody here can relate to me on that. Pray without ceasing says don't stop praying just because your prayer hasn't been answered fast enough to your liking. There are things happening that we have no context to. That's the whole book of Job. There are things happening around us we do not have context to, but God who sees it all answers in His time, not ours. And so, pray without ceasing. Hey, don't stop praying just because it wasn't answered fast enough. I, I, I went to a church when I was at Southern, and there was a person, and I just happened to be there that day because a friend of mine, another theology student, was asked to preach. So, you know, you go and support the homie you know, and, and they did this thing at this church. It was a smaller church, maybe a fourth of the size of this church, and um, so what they did, instead of like the garden of prayer, they would just pass a mic around, and people would, you know, this is my prayer request, this is my praise report, and this lady, it almost felt like we were intruding on the moment, because I know this church had been journeying with her, but she had been praying for her son for 30 years, years. He had apparently left the church and, and all of this, and, you know, she's like 70, and I think he was in his 50s or some, something like that. I'm trying to remember the, the details of the story. The point is, he had gone away. He had lived a life that was uh, detrimental, and she had been praying daily, multiple times daily for 30 years. And, and as the mic is going around and she has it, she is in tears saying, I am so thankful because, because next week I'm getting on a plane and I'm going to visit my son at church. <laughs> She's telling the story. You guys know you've been praying with me for 30 years. We've been praying for 30 years. He's been doing this and doing that for 30 years. I waited, and God was faithful. And I just was like, man, like, this is a special moment that I didn't have context to. I feel like I shouldn't be here. <laughs> but I have, I'm happy I was because that was encouraging to me. And I was like, man, like, pray without ceasing. Do I have the patience to pray for something for 30? I'm not even 30 yet. Like, 
I don't know if I have the patience for that. I think after 30 years, I might have said, I, mean, I think God has other plans. But there's something to be learned when, when you recognize that God is faithful, that you can be faithful also uh, in your prayers. This leads into my next point is do not stop praying because you think it is hopeless. That kind of plays into, like, I, especially in my, like, sophomore in college mindset would have begun to think, I think that situation for that woman is hopeless. She's been praying for 30 years. I think, I think maybe it's time to throw in the towel. Maybe you get a diagnosis. I know there's cancer survivors here. I know there will be cancer survivors who listen to this online uh, or on the podcast or whatever. That's a scary diagnosis to get. I've heard of stories, somebody gets a stage four diagnosis and they're still alive. The doctor comes in, says you have five weeks to live and five years later they're still around. We should not cease praying because we look at a situation and determine that it is hopeless. It's never, I've, I've, been in, I've been on both sides of this. I have had friends who got sick, again, cancer. I've told this story. The whole school came out to pray. You know, these are, these are teenagers in high school who, who have never prayed. Some of them were not even Christian. They just, their parents, for whatever reason, wanted them to go to a Christian school, so they went to FLA. They've never prayed, but they're praying because all of us were going to lose our friend. And our chaplains, our teachers encouraged us to pray. But you looked at the situation, and every single time, every single time, a new, like, thing would come out, how's he doing? It was getting worse. And it was getting worse. And, and he was starting to lose his hair, and, and he wasn't able to walk anymore, and he was losing weight. And there were moments where, again, just in my human nature, I looked at this situation and said, what are we even, what are we even doing? Why are, what are we praying for? Even the, 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 my friend, he had made peace that if I die, it's okay, because the next thing I'll see is Jesus. It was a beautiful testimony. Um, And here's the thing. He did die, and it was awful. But there was something that happened when people, you know, we, 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 we read this verse, we believe this verse, that all things work together for good, right? For those who love Jesus and I've said it before, and I'll say it again. You will always remember me by a few of my like key sayings. We may not live to see that good, but it will be good in the end. We will understand in the end. You know, in that situation, there are people who I said who were not Christian, who did not know Jesus, who know Jesus now because they started praying for like a year. They began to like flex those muscles, if you will, and, 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 and get into a discipline of praying without ceasing and being in constant communication with God. And I'll tell you what, we don't know why that prayer wasn't answered, but other prayers in their life began to be answered and they saw the power of God, that he was real and that he cared for them and that he loved them. And now there are people today who are faithful, Jesus-loving people because of a situation that looked hopeless. I tell you, I've been on the other side of things too, where a situation looked absolutely hopeless and we all got together and we prayed and we prayed and we prayed. And by God's grace, that friend of mine is still alive. We have no context to what is hopeless. We cannot make those decisions. And so, again, pray without ceasing means do not pray when a situation looks hopeless to you. Here's another one. Do not stop praying because your prayer was answered. You follow what I'm saying? 
you, t- you, you, you tiptoe on the line of the vending machine God. <laughs> you get what I'm saying when I say something like that? Or it's like, Jesus, I need a new car. And then a car shows up and he's like, thanks, I'll see you next year. And you just kind of like, you know, that's not constant communication. That's not a healthy relationship. I, I dare you to try that in your marriages. <laughs> I dare you. <laughs> it's not going to work out. I dare you to try that with your friendships. We all have that friend. Raquel and I used to, well, Raquel used to work at Disney. I used to work at Universal when we grew up in Orlando. And we all had those friends who were like, it used, it used to happen to Raquel more because everybody wants to go to Disney. But she'd get these texts from people she hadn't talked to in years. And they'd be like, hey, girl. And Raquel already knew they want my tickets. <laughs> they want me to get them in the park for free. You begin to resent those people. <laughs> right? And then the truth is that person doesn't respect you, right? Like, and so if that's our view of God, if we pray only when we need something and then we stop the second it's answered, we will begin to not respect God. And, and, and there's a hard truth that where, where Jesus will say, listen, I don't know you, at the end. But, but Jesus, we, I prayed to you all the time. I, listen, I don't know you. <laughs> the, the, the reality is when people would text me, hey, can you get me into universe? Like, bro, who are you? Like, you added me on Facebook. I don't know who you are. It's the same with our prayer life. And I want to say this too, as this kind of ties, they all kind of tie in. This is the last one. Do not stop praying, right? Don't stop praying because you got what you wanted. And the flip side of that is also true. Do not stop praying because you didn't get what you want. That's a dangerous place to be where you try, essentially what we do is you try to put the hat on and say like, I am, I am God. You should have done this. And the Bible tells us to approach God with boldness and to approach him with questions. He's not afraid of our questions, but to say, forget you, and I'm never talking to you again because when I needed you the most, you abandoned me. We, again, have no context to some of the stuff that goes, around, goes on around us. We are in a war, right, where we call it the great controversy. There are things happening behind the scenes. Man, there are like a million things a day that probably try to kill us, but God in his goodness protects us, right? And so there's like, there's all this stuff going on, and so for us to say, I, for those of you who are parents, I'm sure you've experienced this, where you do so much and you care so much for your kids, but then they come to you and you say, you didn't get me that toy I wanted. And you just want to be like, oh, I love you so much, right? Like, <laughs> like, there's that moment because they have no context to everything that they have because of what you provided. And we do not even begin to understand the context of everything that goes on in our life because of Jesus. Please, I am encouraging you. There's another side to this too. Please do not stop praying if what you were looking for did not come to pass. Because sometimes the thing that you really, really wanted would have killed you, right? Sometimes the thing you really, really, really wanted would have torn your marriage to shreds, right? Sometimes the thing you really, really, really wanted uh, it, it would have made your kids despise you. Sometimes the thing you really, really, really wanted would have just made you a, 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 an upset person or like, you know, dealing with things that you didn't have to deal with. God knows best. And man, when we talk about prayers being answered, every prayer is answered. It just might not be answered the way we expect it to because this is the thing that we forget about prayer all the time, and it's something that I had to work on in my life. It's something that I had to, you know, experience a few times, that no is an answer. Sometimes we, we may want something. We may think that we need something. And God in his sovereignty and in his love will tell us no. No. And so then two things happen. We either keep, like, <laughs> this, is, this is a different kind of don't see. So we either keep praying and be like, God, like, I thought we had an agreement or, you know, uh, or we just stop praying altogether. But sometimes in his sovereignty and his love, he will tell us 
No. And we'll look back at the end of time, and we will understand. And so, like I said, there's, these are just four, but the list could go on when Paul says, do not uh, uh, pray without ceasing. Don't stop praying because it wasn't answered fast enough. Don't stop praying because you think it's hopeless. Don't stop praying because you got what you wanted, and don't stop praying because you didn't get what you wanted. The verse concludes, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. God's will for us is always better. And this isn't, this isn't an exhaustive list of what God wants for us, right? But God's will for us, Christian people, people who love Jesus, who he's proud of, and I think that God is proud of us. I think he's disappointed also, but I think he's proud. Like, it's, it's a weird thing that his will for us would be to rejoice always, to pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. That's his will for us. And Paul essentially concludes with verse 23, and I want to conclude with this too. As, you know, we've gone with the theme of the day, gratitude, thankfulness, uh, no matter what kind of circumstance you're in. Paul concludes with this, verse 23, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, and he will surely do it. That was true then, and it's true now. In a moment where I was pretty much discouraged, this is the good news. My car's broken, got a cracked radiator, it's looking like it's going to be hundreds of dollars, my entire paycheck that I made the whole month that I was there at camp. But the good news is, and why I can rejoice in this story, why I can be thankful, is because I was in constant communication with my father. And when I reached out to my father, he said, I'm on my way. Jesus Christ, who is faithful, will remain faithful to all of us. No matter what's going on, no matter where we are, pray, give thanks, rejoice always. That's what he wants for you. That's what he wants for me. And so when he says jump, I say how high. And so despite what's going on in life, I will always do my best to do those things. And that's what I want for all of us today too. Let's go ahead and pray. Most kind of Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this Sabbath. Thank you so much for the good news of your son Jesus, that he is faithful and will see us through. Jesus, may you teach us what it means to truly pray without ceasing, that it be a character trait of ours. That when we need something, or we just want to talk, or we want to praise you, or we want to give thanks, Lord, that we open our hearts to you in prayer. Thank you for being a God who is so easily accessible, and so, and so graciously wants to know us intimately. Thank you, Jesus, I pray in your name. Amen. To stand for the closing song, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your mercies. God, thank you for the blessings that you've given us as your children. And so, God, I ask now that through your Holy Spirit, you'd equip us and empower us this week to go and be the blessing for someone else, I pray uh, in your name. Amen. Uh, before the deacons uh, and the deaconesses dismiss you today, in fact, you can be seated. We want to do one thing. So the Symphony of Grace and Love Ministry uh, part of what they do, right? They're the disability ministry, but they also have a passion for taking care of and acknowledging those of you who would identify yourselves as caretakers, right? And so uh, maybe you've, you're 